I'm very pleased to introduce our next session, uh, which, as I said earlier, is a continuation, uh, a logical continuation of our opening um, conversation on the politics of solitary. And to take us there, I'm really honored to have our, as our moderator, uh, Ruben Blau, uh, who is a um, city a reporter for city reporter for the city. Uh, an outlet which covers New York um, and its five boroughs. He worked, he's a veteran New York City uh, journalist. He's worked for the New York Daily News, New York Post, and the Chief Leader, which is um, a privately owned publication which covers uh, civil service employees. And perhaps most uh, relevantly to this conversation, he's co author of uh, Rikers and Oral History. Um, his other co author is moderating one of our panels. Uh, tomorrow, I think. Uh, so he's very appropriate. We're really honored to have uh, Ruben <laughs> to guide us through this panel. Uh, I'll let Ruben take the mic from here on and introduce our distinguished panelists. Uh, we have another 50 minutes to go. And again, if you have any questions, please post them in the Q&A uh, and we'll, we'll get to them and our speakers will get to them um, uh, as we can. Uh, Ruben, over to you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate um, getting a chance to sort of, you know, kind of carry along the conversation. Um, uh, you know, as you said, like I've been kind of involved in this from the journalism side for for close to 20 years. And I just wanted to add, like, you know, my, my history with the chief leader was really primarily covering it from the union perspective. Uh, and I was there for about six years. So, you know, initially, like, you know, the beginning part of my career was really focused just on kind of like what the officers, you know, the concerns the officer has had. Um, and, you uh, really didn't get a chance to kind of do like the 360 um that i have now um so you know obviously kind of evolved as a reporter as well and um you know and this issue really has come to light for me you know mostly as a reporter as in my role at the, as a, at the city where i am now which is like kind of a local nonprofit news site um you know since the death of Lillian polanco and you know the calls for you know the elimination of solitary have really kind of increased since then in, in new york city specifically and actually there's a hearing going on right now at the city council to go over a you know proposed legislation that's been you know bandied about for a while now and you know it's, as i'm sure many of you know on the panel now that you know this has been going on for a while like it's kind of nuts like the board of correction had uh you know had, had spent over a year i think close to two years coming up with rules and then that got put on hold um because of like the end of COVID, and de blasio argued that you know he needed to sign an executive order saying that you know that there was an emergency um procedure in place to hold it up and uh eric adams has now been elected and you know i've written a cover about that that he's actually serious the same lobbyist as coba and there were some concerns from from you know activists and and experts who were pushing for the end of solitary you know what that would mean and one of the first things he did was he he announced his commissioner and he also said like you know look out solitary is coming back so um you know and his commissioner today just took about an hour ago you know had testified that he's very against any of the council changes to solitary while at the same time kind of really splitting hair saying that it doesn't exist in new york city jails and that um you know that it doesn't uh happen anymore so it's a sort of bizarre world almost i feel like i was just talking to a colleague of mine that i were like an alice in wonderland when they talk about this issue it's like now they have a new plan um which is you know i've been doing this for 20 years and it's like probably the fourth or fifth plan um so it's uh you know they're asking for more time which is uh Honestly, even from the reporter point of view, is like just at, at some point, like how many, how much, how many more plants, how many, how much more time needs to be, you know, kind of gone in this direction before something actually happens in a positive, and it's it's kind of hard to see the end. And yeah, that was kind of the New York City sort of position on, on solitary um, and my kind of involvement there. Um, sorry, a lot of words uh, from the moderator who's going to step aside and let everyone else talk. But I wanted to just, I, I feel like you can introduce yourselves better than I can, frankly. Um, so I'd love to go around the horn. And let you kind of just, if you can, just you know, short, brief. Hey, you know what you do, um, how you got, and how you got there, um, and you know, we can start you know the conversation from there. But I'd love to go around, and um, I'm just going to go around like how it looks on my Zoom. So I'll start with uh, Zoe, um, if you can. Yeah. Hi, guys. Um, so I'm Zoe Taylor, and I'm the Kentucky State Director for Red on Crime. Uh, we operate in about 13 states now, I think. Uh, I previously worked for the Nolan Center of Justice, and before that, I was doing research with the Hudson Institute. Uh, that wasn't on criminal justice, that was on East Asia, very different. Um, so I have a variety of thoughts about things, but I primarily in the state of Kentucky do focus on solitary confinement. 
both in adult prisons and in the juvenile facilities. Thanks. And uh, Tammy, uh, if I can go back, is, am, am I saying that right? I'm also terrible at pronouncing. No, that was great. Thank you. And I'm really grateful to be here today. So I'm Tammy Gregg, and I'm one of the deputy directors of the ACLU's National Prison Project and, and director of the Stop Solitary campaign. And the goal of the National Prison Project is to ensure that conditions of confinement in prisons, jails, juvenile detention centers, and uh, immigration detention facilities comply with the Constitution, um, domestic law and international human rights law and principles. And we are working to reverse um, the laws and policies, which everybody is well acquainted with, which have given the United States the notorious distinction of having one of the highest incarceration works, uh, rates in the world. Um, prior to coming to the ACLU, I worked um, for nearly 20 years at the Department of Justice. Um, on similar work doing uh, pattern or practice investigations involving law enforcement and um, uh, carceral settings. Thanks. Thanks. And Robert? Hey, good afternoon. My name is Robert Celine Holbrook. I'm the executive director of the Abolitionist Law Center. Um, the work we do is primarily around dismantling oppressive pillars of the carceral state. Um, and a lot of our work, uh, I would say since our beginning has been involving ending solid, the practice of solitary confinement in Pennsylvania. Um, I was brought to this work, um, just through my experience being in prison, um, did 10 years in solitary confinement. So I, I know the ins and outs of it, unfortunately. Um, and so, yeah, a lot of our work just involves presently right now, getting people out of solitary who have been in solitary confinement for 30, in some cases, 40 years. Um, so um, thank you for having me on this panel. Looking forward to talking about this issue, which is really uh, personal to me. Absolutely, thanks for sharing that. Um, and Christopher, right? is Christopher part, I should, I should know this, but um, is Christopher part of the, um, I think he's not. Okay. No, he's, a, he's our technical guy. Really. That's, what I, thought. Okay, that's what I thought. And Christopher and Katie, just so people he's know. He's the most important guy in the scene. <laughs> okay, Christopher and Katie are, are part of the back. And thank you for kind of working on this with us. So that's what I figured. Okay. Um, I just wanted to start with it just to, and maybe this is like more of like a bigger, broader picture question, but I mean, one of the things I personally struggle with, and I thought maybe you could, you could maybe some people could share some light, shed some light on this is that it's not debatable at this point, right? The solitary is, is, is harmful and actually kind of leads to more violence, arguably. Why do you think, or, and, and anyone can kind of chime in here, but like, why do you think that it's so difficult for this practice to sort of stop or end when this is known at this point, you know, when the research and science exists saying this? I can jump in here. I, I think part of the issue we're having is solitary does serve a purpose while you're incarcerating people especially in, if that person is causing issues with the other population and if they're presenting a material threat to correctional officers, we have to have some sort of tool or mechanism to intervene on that part. But that doesn't mean that we need to be keeping people in these solitary confinement situations for 40 years. That's completely counterproductive to the safety of the inmate and to the safety of um, people who are beyond the, the carceral state. So we really need to look at that and say, what can we do administratively to step in? And that's usually gonna look like data transparency, that's gonna look like reporting mandates and having strict parameters around how we can utilize solitary confinement. I think that at the end of the day, we have to recognize that prison administrators um, the prison regimes just look at solitary as a convenient tool. And unfortunately, uh, prisons like police are being called upon to deal with larger issues, social issues um, that are, for lack of a better word, above their prey grade or out their lane. So in prison, solitary confinement is most often used for people who are having mental health who have mental health disabilities. It's also extraordinarily used in a high number of, on youthful offenders who are having behavioral and adjustment issues. You know, I went into prison, state prison at the age of 16. 
And I would say my first 10 years in prison, I probably spent seven years in solitary confinement. And not just me, but also cohorts of other child offenders that came through the system because we were having to grow up in an unnatural environment, or let me rephrase that, an abnormal environment. And then prison guards were expected to deal with children who, who you know, who, you know, they, they're not trained to deal with youth, but also people dealing with mental health disabilities. And the most convenient way to deal with these two populations is to put them in solitary confinement. It's also done a lot with people who are from the LGBT community. I could remember that was being something that was just like back in the day, maybe 15, 20 years ago, things have changed a lot, but someone who was trans came into the prison system. They didn't know how to deal with it. Like even prisoners didn't know how to deal with it. So it was like, okay, isolate them. You know, we'll figure out what to do with you later. But for now, you isolate them. We saw that happen during COVID. Solitary is just a very con convenient tool for the prison system to deal with either people or categories of people that essentially they shouldn't be dealing with. There's, youth shouldn't be in state prisons. People with mental health disabilities should be given treatment, not trauma. Um, so I think that's one of the main reasons. And then another reason is just let's be real clear is that solitary confinement is also used to prevent prisoners from organizing. Solitary confinement is a tool to prevent prisoners from whether it's addressing their conditions through prison approved channels like lawsuits or grievances because I spent a lot of my time in solitary confinement for filing legitimate lawsuits or grievances or from organizing as we saw in California 10 years ago when they had the prison hunger strike inside of the prisons that changed the solitary regime in California. I, I think we can't discount the fact that prisons are, regardless to where you stand on the social spectrum of whether prisons should exist, the purpose of prisons, prisons contains populations of people who are human beings, who wanna be treated right, and who are going to either protest or pursue um, their constitutional rights through approved channels by the prisons or channels they create themselves. And for prison authorities, it's very convenient and it's necessary, I would say it's necessary for them to contain this population through solitary confinement. And that's another reason why it's used. And then there's the small percentage of prisoners, as Zoe talked about, and I was one of them, that were problematic. Now, what I will say is that in Pennsylvania, 80% of the people who are in solitary confinement are in solitary confinement for refusing to obey an order or something getting on the phone when they weren't supposed to be. I think like maybe less than 10% are there for actual violence, right? Hurting someone, harming someone. So there's that very small number that committed those acts. And some people may feel as though the solitary is the best way to deal with them, but still, you're still talking about a very small percentage of prisoners. And if I could just um, chime in a little bit, I want to flag that uh, I wholeheartedly agree with what Robert's saying and what Zoe said about solitary confinement being used as a way to contain certain uh, disciplinary uh, people who are deemed to be disciplinary problems. Uh, but I want to echo as well what Robert said about the uh, the data shows that most people who are in solitary confinement, putting aside folks who have mental health issues, which is the highest number, there are also individuals who do something like disobeying an order, not getting up, talking back, um, um, not moving fast enough. I mean, the, the list goes on and on on how it uses it as a disciplinary tool to control individuals. Um, and that's problematic because many of those things can be controlled by other things. And so I know we'll probably get to this, but just briefly, I just want to highlight there are so many alternatives to solitary confinement. I believe um, and we advocate that to the extent solitary confinement is necessary, it's for, it should be for hours. It should be not for days or weeks or months, for years. It should be able, it, it should give officials the opportunity to um, de-escalate whatever threat is going on. 
And it only means that you get separated from the general population to deal with what that issue is. And again, they, uh, we're not talking days, we're talking hours. And you're under observation to get under control and then address that issue. To the extent that longer term solitary needs to be used, there are professionals who should be making those assessments about how long you should be in solitary confinement. Um, and then there are folks who, and then if you need to be uh, detained longer, you should be in a unit where you're allowed to have the things that make solitary so harmful. I, I, I apologize if they said this in the last panel, but I have to repeat it. I mean, the most dangerous things about solitary confinement are the isolation, um, the lack of activity, lack of human interaction that's meaningful. Those are the things that you don't need to take away from people to separate them for the general population and to get them under control. It doesn't require months and months and months and years and years and years at all. There are effective programs. New York City has a great one. Pennsylvania has a great one. There are a couple of other states that I'm happy to highlight or share with others later um, where they have successful programs where they isolate people temporarily, um, but they don't deprive them of the things that make solitary so mentally and emotionally and physically harmful. I think everything you said is absolutely correct. And I think what we need to do is have those treatment programs available when somebody has been segregated from the general population. Having no access is only going to worsen an issue, like you said. Um, in Kentucky, actually, we introduced a bill that would require um, the person who put an individual in solitary confinement to both report what the incident was, how they tried to de-escalate the issue prior to putting them into solitary and then having a mandatory reporting after 24 hours and check in. We'll have a mental health person come in and assess the individual and determine whether or not there's a psychiatric or a therapeutic way that we can start to rehabilitate or if we need to examine a behavior, a constant behavioral issue and go from there. So the, these kinds of reporting mechanisms are the thing that can really push the problem past the goal line, right? Like we wanna reform this and for that 10% of the population who are being problematic or who are causing issues for the safety of others, then we can really focus on how can we rehabilitate those people to the best of our ability. We're, it's, it's the same issue we have with parole, right? We have too many resources going across too many things. We're not focusing on the people who, caught, who propose the most amount of risk to everyone else. Instead, we're, we're forcing our correctional officers to play so many different roles rather than allowing them to do what we're asking them to do initially. One thing I would also add to that is that you're also forcing prisoners to do, you know, what they're not trained to do or supposed to do. Because I'll be honest with you, being in that environment, it was incredibly difficult for us to have to deal with someone who was having mental health disabilities and, and just navigate that. So guards are, are doing it, but prisoners who are living with people with mental health disabilities are the ones that are actually doing the, the trauma-informed care that we, we're not trained to do, you know? And, and I don't know if it made it better. I don't know if it made it worse, but it was definitely a position that neither guards or prisoners should be in trying to figure out how to help someone who is having a mental breakdown or trying to help someone just navigate an environment that their mind is just rebelling against and they have no control over. And then putting them in solitary confinement even makes it worse. Yeah, I mean, absolutely, just absolutely Sorry. think bonkers to, you know, comprehend that like somebody you know, going through a mental breakdown is, you know, isolated or that's like the right idea. I just wanted to flag real quick and I appreciate all this. This is incredible. Um, I just wanted to flag a question somebody asked and I thought I was actually going to ask something similar. Um, and it was it was for Zoe specifically, but I guess anyone can chime in after or before. Uh, I don't know if you can see it. It's Salvador Rodriguez asked that, you know, since you work with folks on the right, have you found greater salience about this issue among Republicans, given recent concerns over the solitary confinement of people jailed? for their involvement in the events of uh, January 6, 2021? Um, that's an interesting question. So there's a really large division on the right about how to deal with incarceration and types of criminal justice reform. Every Everyone knows that it's probably the, pardon the pun, but the elephant in the room. And we have to just acknowledge that what we're doing currently isn't the most effective thing for keeping people safe. 
whether that's in the prison or whether that's outside of the prison, the only thing I care about is that everyone can live in a place that they feel safe and go to sleep at night knowing that they're safe. And that means that our prisons have a responsibility to do just that when we have somebody who's demonstrated bad behavior, to put it frankly. And with solitary confinement as a, a mechanism to punish some sort of social behavior um, that they did outside of the prison, I, I think that's inappropriate. Um, uh, I think everything that happens within a prison should be localized to what is going on in the prison, um, whether or not that's, you know, a cogent way to think about it, but everything we do as someone who is within a prison facility should be tailored to keeping people safe and also keeping everything aligned. So while I don't disagree with that, I think that's problematic from a uh, carceral setting perspective sometimes. And what I mean by that is there are categories of people who are vulnerable, um, who may be um, a member of a rival gang, for example, who would probably, who, inside a carceral setting, who would need to have some sort of protection, right? And there are other things in that same vein where people may want to be protected for whatever reason. So I, I agree with you. I hear you that it should be localized generally, but then there are reasons that for, because of what you've done on the outside or your, what's attributed to you, you may need to have some additional protections. And sometimes that's in a more solitary environment, which I'm not saying is the right thing, but that's just what happens from a security standpoint. And if I could just chime in a tiny bit on my experience um, at the ACLU um, with the with the right and the um, January um, 6th insurrection, we have actually had more outreach from folks um, on, on that side of the polit political spectrum who've been interested in being more educated about solitary confinement because of people who've been detained or incarcerated, and it's some of whom have experienced solitary confinement. So we found some alignment because of, of the, the treatment that's been very similar. That's not to say that, that they people who are in that category feel like, you know, they deserve solitary confinement, but they certainly have a little bit more sympathy, I think, toward others who are incarcerated. Yeah, and I think, thing, um, oh, do you wanna go yeah, ahead? One thing too, I, I would just like to add to that is that, um, I certainly do not condone or support anyone being placed in solitary confinement because of their politics, um, regardless to what spectrum, what political spectrum they come on. Many of my mentors were members of the Black Panther Party and Black Liberation Army who spent 30 and 40 years in solitary confinement because of their political position prior to incarceration. Um, but also, you know, one of the most craziest cases I will say that we're dealing with here in Pennsylvania is the case of Daniel Delker, who was a rabid white supremacist and has been in solitary confinement, I believe 48 years now for killing a correctional officer in 1974 or 75 at Western Penitentiary in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. This man is, is old. He presents no threat to the institution. Um, he, he essentially was driven insane by 48 years in solitary confinement. And he's someone that we're advocating for, despite this is someone who, you know, I would never want to be in the same room with when we were on the same housing units or tiers in solitary confinement. He was one of the most disrespectful people. Um, but, you know, he's not someone that deserves to be in solitary confinement any longer. And, you know, we will certainly advocate for his release into a, setting that can deal with his mental health disabilities that are the product of 48 years of solitary confinement. Um, and then the other point about people needing to be placed in solitary confinement for protection, that's an area where I, I disagree. I think that they may need to be put on a separate unit um, from their enemies as prisons can do and the feds do it and, and other prisons do it. I do think that there needs to be some gradual way that they they graduate how how much the separation is needed 
but because someone has an enemy or is, is under threat does not mean that they isolation or solitary confinement should be what the prison system falls back on because I can recall protective custody uh, in Pennsylvania Department of Corrections even now it's still essentially solitary confinement um, you are essentially on an administrative custody unit you are in your cell basically 22 and 2 meaning you're locked down 22 hours you come out maybe for two hours if you're lucky depending on what prison you're in so I do think that that's something that needs to be dealt with, dealt with um, as well, even if it means creating new categories of, of prisons to deal with this vulnerable population. Appreciate that. Robert, two things really quickly. Um, firstly, Tammy, I think I wanted to kind of talk about some of the numbers or clarify some of the numbers that Zoe was talking about. And then I wanted to swing it back to Zoe for one other technical political question, so. Thanks so much, but I actually, Robert, we're not in a different place. Um, when I refer to solitary confinement, I talked about all the things that make a space solitary confinement. And certainly having somebody separated from the general population, but put somewhere they're, where they're safe, but not uh, locking them in for that time frame that you're talking about, you know, not keeping them from making phone calls, not keeping them from, um, make, not having them isolated, that they have actual, you know, communication and contact that's meaningful all of those things should happen. So I just want to clarify, I did not mean to imply that at all. Thanks. Um, and then with respect to the numbers, um, I don't know if people can see the chat, but I do know that there is a Lyman study that has uh, uh, 2022 um, numbers. A report just came out. The data is from a few years before that. Um, what I'd just like to share is there's a huge discrepancy in the number of people who actually are in solitary confinement for a number of reasons. Um, uh, not to pick on the report at all. It's an excellent report and it's been a great um, resource for us for many, many years because there's not a lot of transparency with, um, around the numbers and data reporting as Zoe mentioned. Um, but the report is uh, the product of uh, voluntary compliance, not something that's mandated by the federal government. And so there were a number of states who just didn't respond or didn't reply. It also accounts for prison numbers um, and population numbers. It doesn't account for jails, immigration detention set settings, juvenile justice detention settings. So there's a whole swath that are not included in what the numbers are. And so the best numbers we have are from a Bureau of Justice the Statistics, BJS um, study that came out in uh, 2021, I think December 2021. And in that, the numbers are at least 20 to 30,000 people higher. So I would caution against a, a sentiment or a suggestion that solitary confinement numbers are going down. They're just not. And, and we don't have real tran transparency on what the real number is. Um, and I guess the other thing I would flag is we have to remember that during COVID, um, solitary confinement increased 300%, not three, not 30, 300% because it was used in lieu of uh, medical isolation. Folks just couldn't figure it out, didn't figure it out, didn't follow CDC guidance. So they stuffed people all together in spaces and and kept them in solitary as opposed to medical isolation, which was the guidance. So just flagging that, appreciate the opportunity to share that. Thanks, appreciate that. And, and so there was another question that somebody had, and, I, and similarly, I, I just wanted to add also on that on the talk. Um, you know, when we talk about numbers, it's uh, it's clear just on a Rikers front. You know, again, it's difficult when we talk about like how do you you know the issue and how do you kind of move forward, right? And just from my experience in the Rikers front, it's 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 kind of amazing. It's it's honestly amazing. Like the commissioner, the union, the correction officers, benevolent association is saying we don't do solitary. Um, it, it's honestly, it's it's like it's. It, I mean, for lack of a better term, it's bonkers. Um, you know, Rikers Island is a unique place. Uh, and there's actually places where like there's intake there, which is not like the classic kind of term of intake where like people come in and then they go to another facility. Like when somebody acts out, you typically for somebody who's like mentally ill or like just really disturbed sometimes or like not following the rules, they can put them in intake for days, if not weeks. And there's been cases where people die in intake. Um, and it's and it's really like it's just a form of solitary by any other name. Um, there's a million different areas where they can just kind of get shoveled to where it acts as solitary. So there might not be a, a sort of a traditional, even you know, on the Rikers front, like kind of a traditional solitary unit as much. There's kind of this different name for it right now. It's also called punitive segregation. Um, but yeah, it exists. I mean, there's no doubt in anybody's mind who works there 
and who has spent time there, like, and who's honest about the issue that it exists. And it's funny because like, here we're talking about like solutions, legislation, and at the same time, like the people running the jails, like, and especially in New York are saying like, look, you know, hey, we don't, we're against solidarity too. It doesn't exist here. And by the way, we're, we're changing it. So, you know, I think there's just a lot of, you know, and just, you know, just conversation about the numbers throughout the country is, is, you know, like we're just kind of talking about what that is and how that, you know, adds up. Um, you know, I think, I think it's on purpose. I think there's, you know, I think Rikers obviously is unique, but I don't think it's, I think it's similar throughout many places in the country that, you know, there's a lack of honesty about, you know, what is happening to people in these places that are really out of sight and out of mind on purpose. Um, sorry, Katia, sorry, uh, Katia, where you're asking, you're raising your hand. I'm sorry, I want to stop. No, no I just want to add to what Ru Ruben is saying. If y'all, the three of you, would talk, I mean, because our, our our fellows are from across the country. If you would talk about what is happening politically to the extent that you know it in Kentucky, nationally, regionally, what should we be following? Who are the players politically and what sort of is the, the momentum for what is being proposed? I can speak to Pennsylvania and I'll second what you're talking about, Ruben, in that Pennsylvania has uh, probably five different acronyms for solitary confinement. It has restricted housing unit, behavior modification unit, intensive management unit, special management unit, restricted release, and I'm actually forgetting probably two or three others that Pennsylvania has. So all of those are, are solitary confinement, but according to the Bar Department of Correction, they're not. So it's really a semantic game that's going on with this. I don't know if that's what's happening in Rikers Island, but essentially we define solitary confinement as anyone being in the lockdown for, I believe it's over uh, 12 hours a day confined to their cell. I, although I could be wrong on that because it's been a minute since I've actually been looking at the, the, the policy. So that's what's going on in Pennsylvania. Um, under Secretary Wetzel, the former Secretary of the Department of Corrections, I will say that sol the solitary regime of Pennsylvania trained, changed drastically. Um, that, however, was a result of the Disability Rights Network and the Department of Justice filing a lawsuit against Pennsylvania because of the way it was keeping people in solitary confinement for decades. It essentially turned things around and solitary units changed up. Now, what Pennsylvania did and I think this, this speaks to something that um, we were talking about earlier, although I, I don't know, remember if it was Tammy or Zoe, but there are so many people, the Department of Corrections in Pennsylvania found out that essentially 85% of its prison population have mental health disabilities, mental health issues. So here you have 85% of a prison system that at the time had close to 50,000 prisoners in. Politicians look at prisons as an accountability factor. You're in there to be held accountable. They didn't want to deal with that number. They're basically saying like, yo, we can't place 85% of, of the prison population in solitary confinement because they have mental health disabilities. So what the Department of Correction did was it created a tiered system of codes. And so that people who have decodes can't be placed in solitary confinement. They could be placed in a for lack of a better word, an isolated unit, but they have to come out their cell as individuals, certain amount of hours a day. They have to act, have access to recreation, phone calls, the ability for some type of mental stimulation. But that's still a small number because you have, the Department of Correction also has C codes, which are people who have mental health disabilities, and this is the bulk of the population, but they are in this weird, transitory code where one day they could be a decode, the next day could be C code. And so they could go in and out of, yeah, you can go to solitary confinement, but no, you can't depending on your unit management team. Um, so I think that there's, a, there's several things really preventing drastic change in solitary confinement in Pennsylvania. One is the accountability factor. You just have a lot of politicians because we're trying to advocate for the Mandela rules up here on both sides of the aisle who really are like looking at this issue like are we basically saying that we're taking a tool away from corrections but they I, I feel like they just don't want to reckon with the fact that yeah your your prisons are essentially dumping grounds for people with mental health disabilities and this is what it's become 
Um, so that's part of the landscape in Pennsylvania. There's a new secretary, Greg Little, who, is, who has continued the reforms that Secretary Wetzel has done, which being transparent as someone who was in solitary confinement during those years, it has changed. Um, it is, it is uh, for lack of a better word, not as better or not as oppressive as it, as it used to be, but there are still units within the Department of Corrections that are deeply repressive where people have been in those units for 15, 20, 25 years and still have no pathway for release, but the Department of Corrections are not calling them solid, calling it solitary confinement. They're essentially calling it closed custody, intensive management, and these and these other terminology terminologies. And so the ultimate question, unfortunately, is is going to rest with the legislature um, to to move beyond. Um, a lot of their personal views and political views when it comes to mass incarceration in, in the United States. And then also the litigation as we feel is, is probably our, our best route to rolling back many of these arbitrary um, solitary confinement units. We're doing several class action lawsuits against it. We were able to eliminate death row because all the death row in Pennsylvania, 300 people were in solitary confinement. We brought a lawsuit, we ended that. Um, and, and we're and we're basically building off of that lawsuit to try and um, bring about larger changes to Pennsylvania's solitary regime. And then I'd, one thing I will close with is Philadelphia County Jail is perhaps the most violent county jail in the country. Eight people have been killed just this year alone in that prison. Now, I'm talking about killed. This doesn't involve people dying from uh, uh, medical neglect. And the entire prison has been under solitary confinement since because of COVID. And that's, that is kind of keeping with my experience that some of the most violent units that I've been in in prison have been solitary units because it, it just makes the atmosphere and the situation much better. So Philadelphia's entire county system has been under solitary confinement for the past two and a half years. And it's the one of the, it's, it's had, it's probably the most violent prison in the country because it's in solitary. So for people who say that solitary make prisons safer, um, I would urge you to study Philadelphia County Jail, as well as other um, states that have prisons on entire lockdown regimes, and then study prisons that have a more um, open uh, prison regime, and you'll see that the rates of violence in those prisons, I believe Colorado really led the way in, in this, that you could see that you can eliminate solitary confinement and it not increase prison violence. Because at the end of the day, and I tell you some personal experience, if someone is gonna harm someone in prison, they're not thinking about whether or not you're gonna spend a year in solitary confinement, two years in solitary confinement. There's a saying in prison that, uh, does the clock stop when I go into solitary confinement? And that, that basically means does my sentence stop? Um, and it doesn't. And also prisoners, there's, there's the prison regime that has its policies. And then there's the prisoners regime that has, governs itself. And at the end of the day, any prison you go in in the country, you'll learn that very quickly that prisoners have a way of regulating and governing themselves and whether or not someone's gonna do something to someone else, nine out of 10 times does not factor in how much time in solitary confinement you're gonna get. Really appreciate that, Robert. Thank you for, for that. It's a really kind of comprehensive response. So we just wanna swing it back to you on, on the political side. Tammy, I'm gonna swing back over on the, on the correction of the correction <laughs> for a minute. I appreciate the clarification and, and the real thoughtfulness. Um, so I want to swing back to you really quickly about the political, like you know, side of this. Like, what what's the landscape like? Um, the landscape can really vary, of course, state by state. I think you know I, I'm the Kentucky state director, so I can only really speak about Kentucky. But we've introduced bills. We've talked about it. People are very open to it. Last year, we just introduced it too late. We had a pretty funny session. But we also have a juvenile justice component, and that's going to extend into making alternative housing options eventually for juvenile offenders and truant offenders, and thinking about the way that we are punishing youth, but also the way that we're reforming and rehabilitating youth. And that'll go into the way that we deal with our adult populations. So the like I said earlier, we we propose this basically inspector general style administrative reform into the prisons where you would have somebody monitoring and assessing the individuals who are in solitary confinement. 
I, I think the most effective way to make change is, to be frank, not in the legislature. It's with DOC, it's with, on the federal level, it's with BOP. I, who, who knows the prison better than the people who run the prisons, right? And they're the ones who understand the nuances and the intricacies and the problems that can present because of a domino effect. And the way I've always operated is with the end in mind. So I want this thing to happen, but what if I accidentally do unintended consequences because I haven't taken the full spectrum of the reality into consideration? And I think everyone just has to sit down and have a candid conversation push politics aside and look at how we can protect people and how we can make things better, because that is the primary objective of all that we do, is how can we make things better and how can we prevent bad things from happening? Appreciate that. I, I will say this, and I'm gonna swing it over to Tammy after for the kind of national perspective and also just back on the study for a minute. Um, going back on the record stuff, just in part, because that's where my familiarity lies is that you know, we talk about change on the inside. Um, you know, I, I had a, a fantastic conversation last week with, and I had a story coming out about, um, you know, there's a lot of talk about installing a receiver in, in Rikers because they've been under, they've literally had four federal monitors um, for decades, including one for the last seven years who's kind of in charge of everything almost. And, and when I say in charge, like they do these reports and every time they report, it's like once, once or twice a year and it's, it's worse and it's worse and it's worse and it's worse. And the activists are saying, look, there's been three commissioners, now there's been two mayors and nothing changes, you know? So there's a big push now to do receivership. And this guy, uh, interestingly, Earl Dunlap, who was in charge, of, some people out here might be familiar with him. He was in charge of, he was actually kind of not technically a receiver, but he was like kind of the administrator of the Cook County Juvenile Detention Center there for a bunch of years. Um, and one of his things was like, look, you know, there's a lot of good people with a lot of good ideas internally trying to, trying to make these changes. and you know, the powers that be for some reason and just the structures that exist make it impossible. And, you know, Rutgers Island Corrections, the city department, DOC has had, I've covered probably close to 10 commissioners at this point and each one of them has had their own plan and their own ideas to change things. And, you know, literally like there's a, a hearing today in the city council detailing how it's, you know, the worst place in the country and that it's likely gonna be, I think close to 500 stabbings and slashings this year. Um, which would be you know, higher than anyone per capita. Uh, anyhow, I'm sorry, I talk about Rikers too much. Tammy, I just wanna swing it back to you on the political policy. Sure, thank you so much. So I'm gonna, in the interest of time, just, sorry. I think you muted yourself accidentally. I'm really good at doing that. Um, there was a public, um, opinion poll that was taken recently, I just put the link in the chat, um, the by the University of Maryland. And it actually does show there's a significant shift in public opinion about the uh, pervasiveness of solitary. And just really quickly, folks will have to look at the link for more detail. It actually shows us a bipartisan shift. Um, if you look at the link, it shows at least 84% of Republicans are interested in seeing solitary shift and not be so punitive, um, which is a huge number in favor of moving to a different system, right? And um, for Democrats, it was 90 plus, I think 93%. I don't want to be misquoted on that, but it's in the study itself. And you'll also see, interestingly, that I believe the, like you mentioned New York, and, and I think Robert mentioned HALT. Um, the states are le le leading the charge here. Advocates are le leading the charge. They are pushing the legislatures to a different place. And just to give you some numbers behind me, just making the general statements, um, in uh, the past few years, lots of legislatures, even if they haven't banned solitary, have taken steps to prohibit um, some activity um, that used to have uh, vulnerable populations included. They've made some sort of change. I think folks generally know in the landscape is that New York, Connecticut, and New Jersey, and again, I'm not saying these states are perfect, but they've made significant advancements in banning solitary confinement. Likewise, right now, California has a, um, a bill that's pending. Um, we'll know something by Friday if it's gonna pass, but it will have significant ramifications. It built on halt and the changes made in adopting the Mandela rule there. And it, it actually is going to impact immigration detention as well. And it will probably be one of the most progressive laws in the country if that were to pass. Um, and it had overwhelming support in both of their state legislative bodies, even though the number that was provided um, by folks who, who were concerned about the cost was a little bit inflated, maybe more than a little bit, but it was inflated. It still passed overwhelmingly um, through both bodies. And now it's up 
to the uh, to the governor, obviously, to approve that, um, and hopefully he will. But in addition to that, um, in 2019, we saw 29 states introduce solitary reform legislation. Eight of those states made significant changes and were passed in the law by those governors. Um, I have a whole list of states, which I'm happy to share after this, that have done something in the solitary space to limit it significantly. The public opinion has changed about solitary confinement in a way that um, I think has benefited, obviously, all of those states that are represented. Um, the, the numbers are significant. We don't always have, obviously, successful legislation. Like Halt took, I'm, um, correct me if I'm wrong, I think it was five years and a lot of action. Same thing with these other states. It's not, it's not gonna come fast, it's not gonna come quick, but so much momentum is being built, it's incredible. And then I think Katie actually asked about like the federal uh, perspective. And the last panel had Representative David Trone on that. Um, obviously he's introduced a solitary confinement reform bill that will um, be progressive and will push the, move, the, the needle forward on that. Um, we also have Senator Durbin um, who has a solitary reform bill that limits solitary to um, not as, as progressive as I would like as far as it being hours and, and instead of days, weeks, and months, but it moves the needle significantly. And that's another federal bill that is getting traction. Um, in addition, I know folks know on the call already that the president um, on May 25th, uh, 2022, um, he issued an executive order and in that executive order, he requires the Department of Justice, which is um, over, has authority over the Bureau of Prisons, U.S. Marshal Service, and some, which, and the Bureau of Prisons, of course, is one of the largest um, incarceral, incarcerated settings, um, to report on what they're doing to reduce solitary confinement. Report hasn't been issued yet, but it's supposed to be issuing six months after that date, which I think is about November 20 something. And so there's a lot across the country on the federal level, and I would say the administrative level, since we're dealing with um, the Department of Justice and the Bureau of Prisons, uh, there's uh, people seeking transparency and asking for it to be reported out so that we can take action in those areas. Sorry, that was so long, but it's a lot of lot going on in that landscape that's really important. Appreciate that. Incredibly, incredibly comprehensive. That was like helpful for me. I mean, I you know, cover some of this, not, not aware of, so very, really appreciate that. Um, I, you know, I think we're closing on time, which stinks because um, I really typically enjoy longer conversations and it's difficult to kind of, I understand these are like very complicated issues. Although, you know, I think, I think there's a strong understanding that this is, you know, like the science and research shows, you know, how fault of this is. So, you know, I don't want to make it, you know, the two sides, but I think it's complicated and how things move forward and how things are staying the same. Um, uh, but I would want to just give everyone an opportunity to kind of give some type of closing statement or, you know, you know, issue they wanted to kind of bring up or that they think that, you know, the public, you know, would be helpful to sort of be aware of, you know, or, or some type of misconception. I'll start. Um, when you are incarcerated, and I think people know this, uh, but sometimes forget, you don't use, lose your humanity. And I think Robert was talking about that earlier. Justice Kennedy has talked about that in his, his prior opinions. Um, you still deserve to be treated with humanity, even, uh, and solitary is the opposite of being treating pe people with humanity, right? And um, in the way that it's done now. I'd also add that um, there are so many misconceptions, some of which you spoke about in the beginning in your comments about the cost of, of solitary confinement, about the fact that it keeps people safer um, inside and outside, about the fact that it's a way to make people prepared for going out in the real world because you put, the, you put them in check, essentially. Data is the exact opposite of all of those things. So those misconceptions and things that people use to justify solitary confinement is not supported by data. Thank you. I'll go. So, <laughs> sorry. Um, so two two main things here. Um, I, I'm a policy person. I'm policy oriented. And it's, at the end of the day, it comes down to fact and it comes down to what we really need to do. And I think those two things are data transparency and data reporting. Like we've talked about, we need, I always joke, it's like, the worst thing you can do for yourself is try to find government statistics 
it's the biggest headache I've ever had. I think I have a mental breakdown every time I try to do any sort of reporting. Um, so really clear and tangible reporting that you can look at and that we can we can have a check on these institutions because that is the most important thing is that we can all access it and make sure that things are going as we need them to. And the second thing is there needs to be the due process orient of this. When you go into solitary confinement, we should maybe think about it as similar to the original intake, right? We need to have a clear reason. We need to have a clear defined amount of time and we need to have parameters, like I've said. And those are the things that I think can really reduce the number of people who are in solitary confinement and reduce the overall time and therefore lead to less harmful outcomes. Appreciate that. I, I want to jump in one more second. I, again, not my closing, but, um, and I do, re, I totally, you know, from the reporter side of view, obviously like completely appreciate the transparency and the stats and, you know, understand that the importance of that. I will add like, again, from the Rikers point of view, um, it's incredible. Like when it comes to the stats, they literally keep these stats in something called a log book uh, where they hand write some of these, this, this information and, and the amount of manipulation is 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 like off the charts. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm also like very skeptical when it comes to this issue. Like it's there's so many fundamentally like rotten kind of at the core issues here when you talk about like oh we need stats to show like you know what works what doesn't work. I think we understand that the solitary doesn't work right. There's there's, there's stories and, and things like that that have come up. Um, and I, I do think that yeah it would be helpful to know like how you know if it's getting worse if it's getting better in the usage of it 100 percent but I'm also and I don't mean to be like some a conspiracy theorist here but like I also like seriously question when it comes to the DOC like and, and just from New York City which is supposed to be like kind of like the liberal you know mecca you know when it, on, on these issues where I can only imagine how much worse it is in other places you know we're just there's not a lot of funding or it's not even it's not computerized it's manipulated and it's been this way for years I mean like we actually have a chapter in our book about this like so we, you know even just getting just the deaths you know reporting the deaths is controversial which is like really kind of like 101 like how do you not kind of identify like when somebody you know dies in your jail like that that alone is not happening right now on a federal or state level um so you know like when it comes to stats i think there's a lot of confusion and, and it just it's so off the charts you know you know beyond the pale of like i think any other kind of governmental kind of you know research anyhow I so we, time, but I want we to unfortunately have to, have to cut it off. We're just about at the end of time. Uh, we have um, a couple of questions that are still on the table. Um, we don't have time to answer them now, but we're going to send them to our, our speakers and they can answer afterwards and we will uh, send them back to you. The questions are all about uh, the progress of various legislation, uh, legislative acts around the country, which I think are very important and are very, uh, be very useful for you to know and for the panelists to answer. But I want to thank... Um, uh, Ruben for leading the conversation and all of our speakers for a really, really good exposition of where we're at now in solitary, even within the limited time we have. Uh, you really brought us um, gives a lot of information I think will be useful. So can, thanks to can all I, of can you. Can I ask one more thing, Stephen? Like just, if everyone, yes. I don't know if they could do it in the chat, but if people want to reach everyone, like if there is a contact information, I feel like sometimes no. when we have these panels, people are like, oh, I have a question for you. Like, I'd like to reach out to you for whatever reason. Like, I don't know if, if we can ask. We will do that. Or... We will, we will okay. provide the uh, contact information to everybody as we usually do uh, at the end of the, uh, uh, the two-day session. So thank you all. Um, and we'll take another 10-minute break uh, before we get to our next panel. Thanks for joining us. And I hope, uh, by the way, our speakers can stay with us. Feel free, if you can, to stay with us for the rest of the day and for the other, for the other sessions. Thank you all. Thank you.